really remember. But so the baptism, baptistry, the, the, the hardware hadn't been used. So I, I filled it up this week, middle of the week, tested it out, worked perfect. That was great, emptied it. Filled it up again yesterday, turned the heater on, and uh, figured, well, everything is good. And, and so at, last night at 1 o'clock in the morning, I woke up. That's not unusual because what happens when you wake up in the middle of the night? First thing you think of is, i got to go to the bathroom, right? So I had that feeling, so I won't deny that. But as I'm getting back into bed, I said, I wonder how the baptistry's doing. It must be okay. But I do have, we have like a smart control so I can check my phone. And I checked my phone and it said that the temperature of the water was 62 degrees. I said, oh my goodness, what happened? It should be 90, by the way, or, or a little more. And it was 62 degrees, one o'clock in the morning. Oh no, what are we gonna do? So here's what I did. I put on my clothes. I drove over to the church to check things out. And it turned out that uh, and it must have happened just before that because the water in the, in the baptistry was still at 90 degrees, but the control stopped working. The f it, it blew a fuse or a breaker went off. And I flipped it back on. I figured out what caused that. And I waited around to make sure it worked, and it worked fine. It's worked fine ever since. So um, that's just amazing how God woke me up just at the right time after that breaker went off. The water did not cool down, and there I, I went there and turned it back on, and here we are. And isn't that a great story? But that's not the end. Like on TV, wait, wait, there's more. Okay, so remember I said it was 1 o'clock. Well, it took me about an hour to get dressed, come over here and get her, make sure everything's working and get home again. And I'm just getting into bed, and I look at my clock on my phone, and it says, 1 o'clock. <laughs> I'm going, did this really happen? <laughs> well, you know what it was. At two o'clock in the, in the morning is when the hour changes and we gain an hour and my, my clock went back to one o'clock and it was like it never happened and I didn't even miss an hour sleep. So I think if you think that's coincidence, you can go ahead and think so. But I think all of that was the hand of God. Let's give him a clap offering. God, you're amazing. <laughs> I still can hardly believe it. Okay, today we're starting a brand new message series called Love Like Jesus Loves. You know, a message series on love sounds like that's a light one. That ought to be nice, right? It's not about money. It's not about hell. You know, it's about love. You would think that's going to be an easy one, and I hope it is a good one. In fact, I think it has the potential, this series, to really change our lives, and, uh, and I'm excited about it. And in some ways, it is easy because everyone, we all know what it's like to love, right? Uh, to love someone or something, you love your children, you love your parents, you love your spouse, maybe you love your job, whatever it may be. You know, we know what love is. But we're going to talk about being a different kind of lover, a great lover. We're going to talk about loving like Jesus loves, okay? In fact, the theme verse for our series is John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. It says this, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay, to actually do that, to actually love like Jesus loves, you have to go deeper than just that. So we're going to dive in and look at three different parts of Jesus' love that we as his followers are called to also do. The first is today, we're going to look at in order to love like Jesus, we must forgive like Jesus forgives. Okay, we need to be great forgivers. This whole day is about Jesus forgives sinners, right? Next week, we're going to look at the theme of how Jesus showed love by serving. And then week three, how he showed love by creating community that lasts forever. Forgiving like Jesus forgives. That's our, that's our subject today. Here's what we know about Jesus, right? Jesus forgives sinners. Who would argue with that? And who wouldn't be thankful for that? I want to relate a true story to you that comes from another person, another pastor. 
And, uh, and I want to relate it because he shares an incident that in this incident, you may not have the same experience, but in your own way that you perhaps will also see yourself in this too, in the area of forgiveness. Let me read this to you. You can only imagine how devastating it was when our family found out the news about my little sister's sixth grade teacher, a man that I'll call Max. It's not his real name. Max was a very disturbed, very sick man that we discovered later on actually groomed lots of little girls that came through his sixth grade class. We discovered that this very, very sick man abused my sister, along with many other girls that were victims of his abuse. This went on for years and years until it came to light and he was in prison. That's the true story. Now, he says, sexual abuse of any type is more heartbreaking than you can imagine. I'm going to tell you what he did was on the extreme end of it. There's really, really bad, and then there's extremely, really, really bad, and he was on the extreme end of it. I was a freshman in college and not yet a Christian when we discovered the news. From that moment on, I literally hated the man, and I wanted to see him suffer, die, and burn in hell. Okay, I wasn't a Christian, and I wasn't a pastor then, and I felt that way, and I wanted to see him suffer. Something happened along the way for me in college. I ended up becoming a Jesus follower, but I still hated Max. I went to church one day, and my pastor preached on a text that shook me to the core of my being. The text is Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Jesus said, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Then there was verse 15. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When I read that verse, I had this sense of panic because there was nothing in me that ever, ever wanted to forgive Max for what he did. I knew I couldn't do that. So I questioned, could I even be a true Christian if that was true? I felt I was, yet this is what the text says. How can you forgive someone who does something that seems absolutely unforgivable? And I'm going to stop reading that story. I'll pick up some of it later. Let me ask you this. Do you feel that in your own way? I bet some of you do. Can you empathize with this person, this Christian? In your own way, you may struggle to forgive a person, a trespass that just seems he, that's too far. It's too bad. I can't forgive that. So today, as we do this message, we're not going to play games with forgiveness. That's the kind of forgiveness we're thinking about today when we consider that forgiving like Jesus forgives. You know, this text, this next text that we're going to start with as we pursue that is Luke chapter 23. We're going to see, I think, the most dis amazing display of forgiveness that you ever could imagine, even more amazing than something that might come out of that story. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Keep the context in mind. Remember, Jesus was completely innocent. He never, ever sinned. He hung between two criminals at the time. As we pick up the story in Luke 23, it says this, Two other men, both criminals, were led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him along with the criminals, one on the right, the other on the left. Now, as we read this, realize what's going on. We, I could say more, but let me at least say this. The cross, the cross was a, a form of of death that was designed to torture, to bring excruciating pain and excruciating humiliation to the person who was being crucified. In fact, that word excruciating actually comes from the cross. It, it, it means out of the cross, excruciating. Then when people were crucified, people would come by and spit at them and mock them. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus as he hung on his cross. They were spitting at him. They were mocking him. One of the criminals, one of the criminals right next to him said, 
Hey, you saved others. Why not save yourself and us? Others said, Hail, hail, King of the Jews. They were spitting on him and mocking him. And, and then at that moment when creation, his creation was at its worst toward him, mocking the creator in the flesh, Jesus prayed the most amazing prayer. He looks up to the Father, and as they were doing the worst to the one who was giving his life for them, Jesus says this in verse 34. He says, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus was asking for forgiveness to those who were sinning against him in that moment, for forgiving something that seemed totally and completely unforgivable. So if there's one thing that we know about Jesus and forgiveness, it's this. We've said it already. Jesus forgives sinners. Let's face it. If you live long enough, you're going to be hurt by someone, every one of us. In fact, many of you right now are carrying some significant hurt, some significant wound. Someone abused you, someone took advantage of you, lied to you, cheated you. Someone hurt someone you love. Someone who is a Christian didn't act very Christ-like towards you. Some church that you are a part of hurt you, and they may not even know that they've done it. And there's probably some of you, you were hurt hurt by someone who is no longer even alive, and yet you still carry the weight and the bitterness of that wound against you. Some of you, it's not really something really, really big, but it's just that ongoing, perhaps that ongoing person that every time you're around, around them, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard, you know? They just say things to you, and it's whatever you do, it's not good enough, and they criticize, and they just make you crazy. Every time you're around, it's, ah, you know, some of you, it's yourself. You did something in your past, and you can't believe that you did it, and you can't undo it, and you're carrying unforgiveness toward yourself. You may even know God has forgiven you, but you're still unwilling or unable to forgive yourself. That raises the big question I want us to address today. As we learn to love like Jesus, how do we do it? How do we forgive like Jesus? This is at the heart of the gospel, folks. Jesus came to forgive sinners, and, and we're sinners. And as we're forgiven, he calls us to forgive sinners. I want to share two thoughts with you this morning on the how. I think they come right out of Scripture. They come right off Jesus' cross. How do we learn to forgive like Jesus forgives? There's two crosses, two thoughts. They're, they're easy to understand. They're not easy to do, okay? And in both of them, I want you to remember this about both of them. In both of them, there's a choice and there's a process to it. There's a, it begins with a choice of obedience and it becomes a process that the Holy Spirit empowers and enables for true forgiveness to happen. Here's the first one. The first thought is this, Jesus actually teaches us, like he did, to pray for those who hurt us, to pray for those who hurt us. That's the first thing we should do, pray for those who hurt you. What was Jesus doing on the cross? That's what Jesus taught us to do. In Luke 6, 28, Jesus said this, he said, bless those who curse you, and then do what? In fact, is it up on the screen? And then it says, I don't know if you can read it. But it says, if you can, read it quietly. Don't read it out loud. He said, bless those who curse you. And then he said, and pray for those who abuse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Some of you are like, all right, pray. I'll pray for them. All right, I'll pray for them. You know, I'll pray they get hemorrhoids. How's that? You know, that's what I'll do. I'll pray they walk in front of a bus. I'll pray for them. I'll pray, God, that you just judge them and that they burn in hell. Okay, God, I'll pray for them. Well, let me say this. That's probably a step before the first step in the process. <laughs> okay, that's not what we're talking about. Seriously, make a decision, a choice to pray for them. What Jesus said was really very shocking, to pray for our enemies to pray for those who hurt you. He said this again and again. He said it in Matthew 5. In fact, if you've been a Christian for a while, and many of you that I see, I know are, 
you know, don't let the familiarity of these verses rob you of the significant impact they should have on us today. Jesus said in Matthew 5.43, he said it like this. He said, you've heard it said. In other words, you've been taught your whole life from the world this truth or untruth, really. Everybody teaches you this. He says, you've heard it said, love those who love you and hate those who, are, who hate you or unkind to you. But I tell you, and this was jaw-droppingly shocking, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those, there it is, pray for those who persecute you. You know, the, I, I'm, I wasn't there, but I'm absolutely certain the moment that Jesus said that, there, you could hear a pin drop. What? What did he just say? Did I just, did I just hear what I thought I heard Jesus said? It can't be. I mean... They would have just found that so hard. You see, if they were Romans, the Roman audience, they actually had a god they worship. It was called the god of revenge. So that was part of their culture. And the Jewish audience had always been taught an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, blood for blood. When someone else wrongs you, you wronged them back. You know, they get equal. You know, this is radical what Jesus says. And it's easy, I think, for us to say, yeah, yeah, love your enemies, okay. It's kind of easy to say that until you actually have an enemy, right? Until someone molests your little daughter or your sister or lies about your wife or lies about you. Here's what I hope you're going to see. The first place we start is we actually pray for them for them. We pray for them. We don't pray that something bad would happen to them. We actually start to pray for them. You start by making a choice to do that. It's not a feeling. Uh, if you're waiting for a feeling to begin to forgive or even pray for someone who did something significantly wrong to you or to someone you love, you may be waiting until Jesus returns before that feeling comes, right? Let's call it what it is. If you're waiting to be in the mood, you may never be in the mood to do this. You start by choosing. It's a choice. You do something that Jesus says you should do, and uh, he did. And then eventually, through a process, the right choices will lead to right feelings and right actions. It's a process, so you got to start somewhere. And so you start like this. Okay, I'll pray. I'll pray. There might not be much to that prayer. It might start with something along the lines of, God, do something in his life. That's about all I can pray, God. Do something in his life. Do something. Whatever you want to do, God, do it. Do something. Then after a while, if you start praying that prayer, maybe it'll take weeks, but you might, it might go to something like, God, do something significant in their life. God, do something significant in their life, something meaningful, because it's kind of easy to pray, do something, right? Because that's kind of open-ended. You could think of a lot of things that God might do that you might like, right? But you start praying a little bit deeper. And after a while, you keep praying. Your prayer becomes, God, do something significant in his life and bless him, God. Bless him. Save his soul, God. Save his soul. You pray. Now, let me tell you this about prayer. When you start praying for someone that you hate, when you start praying for your enemies, it's a process. You're not there yet, but you're praying. When you start praying for your enemies, listen to me, your prayer may or may not change them. Now, prayer is powerful. It may, it may change them. God may use that prayer and change them, but it may or may not change them, but it will always change you. Let me say it again. Your prayer for others may or may not change them. It will always change change you. How do you love like Jesus? Well, number one, you actually pray for those who hurt you. You pray for them. Here's the second one. Then we need to get to the point where we forgive as Jesus forgave you. Don't miss the second part of that saying. We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. This is so important. We forgive in the same manner that God has forgiven us. We forgive as we've been forgiven. Colossians 3.13 says it directly. Paul said to do what? If you have it there, 
It says, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must all forgive. What are we to do? He said we're to forgive. How are we to forgive? As the Lord has forgiven you. You forgive as the Lord forgave you. We forgive as the Lord forgave us. I don't know about you. I can't speak about your life. But God has forgiven me a whole lot. I don't know what you've done. I don't know how many lies you've told. I don't know how many people you've hurt. How many, uh, you know, uh, things that you've done that you shouldn't have done. Uh, how often you disobeyed and sinned against God. I, ca I can't speak for you. But I can tell you right now, I've been forgiven of a whole lot by, uh, by a God that I don't deserve to be forgiven anything for. From a holy God. If he's forgiven me of a lot, then I am to forgive freely as I have been forgiven by him. We must make a choice here again to forgive. And it, then it becomes a process where God works in us to make that full forgiveness as time goes on. See, in our fleshly nature, we may not have what it takes to forgive like that. But by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, as we're praying for them, as we're asking, say, God, I'm choosing to forgive. You know, we can learn to forgive like we have been forgiven. Okay? We keep praying and we keep choosing to forgive. We may not feel forgiving, but God will work full forgiveness in us as we're faithful to be obedient to him. How do we forgive the unforgivable? How do we do it? We forgive as we have been forgiven. At some point, you make a choice. I want to forgive God. I'm not quite there yet. I, I, but I'm going to choose to do what you, God, what your word has said and work toward it. God, I'm going to, going to choose to forgive him. I'm going to forgive her. Or, or you can just go on and not forgive. You could say, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just be bitter. I'm going to be unforgiving. I'm going to hate them for the rest of my life. I mean, just walk that, down that road for a minute. You know, just choose to be bitter all you want. You know, I'm bitter, God. I am bitter. Anytime I see him, anytime I see her, I, I feel anger, you know, and bitterness. I'm doing that, God. Christmas time is coming. They're going to be there. I'm going to be miserable the whole time. The whole time, whenever they're around, I'm angry. You know, every time I think about them, I'm going to get really, really mad. Three o'clock in the morning, I think about them, I'm mad. They may not even know I'm mad, but I'm mad. I'm going to be bitter. I'm just going to be the best bitter person around. I'm going to be filled with hateful thoughts. I'm not going to forgive them. Every time I think of someone like them, I'm going to think of them and I want to claw their eyes out. I'm going to want them to suffer. You know, I want them to go to hell. I want them to let it fester inside me. If asked what I'm going to be, well, I'm going to be the best bitter person around. Anne Lamont said, and I love this quote, bitterness and hate is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Is that your game plan? How's that working out for you? What do you do? What do you do when you've been hurt? You start praying. You take it to God. You pray. You just be honest with him. You say, God, I don't want to do this. It's not right. It's not fair. They did what they did, but I'm choosing to forgive as you forgave me. You pray. You just tell God. You keep telling God. You keep telling God. Then one day... God does a miracle, and you go find your frozen CD, and you just let it go. Right? You let it go. You just do it. You just make a choice. And, and you know what? By faith, you say, by faith, God, I'm choosing. I may not feel like it yet, but I'm going to start letting this go. I'm going to let go of what they said. Next time I think of them, when, when anger comes, I'm going to pray for them. God, I'm going to begin letting it go. I'm going to let go of what they did. I'm going to let go of the hurt. I'm going to let go of the bitterness. I'm just going to let it go. In the same way that God let my sins go, Lord, in the same way that Jesus shed his blood to forgive me so I can be forgiven, I'm choosing by faith to let it go. I'm choosing 
by faith. Let me close out our time with the rest of the story of that pastor and his sister. Can I do that? This might, I think this just illustrates everything I've said. He went on and said, After praying and praying and praying, I will never forget, I was at home from college for Christmas, and my family was talking about it, and we as a family collectively made a choice to forgive him. I was a new, the new on fire Christian, so I wrote him the note. I wrote him a letter and said, Dear Max, and I told him all that we know what he did to my sister and others and that they were very hurt by that. But because of the grace of Jesus and what he's forgiven us of and because of what he teaches us, we choose to forgive him. I explained to him the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus did on the cross for us, what his death and resurrection meant and what, the, what this provides. I explained to him that no matter what he's done, that if he would call out and ask for forgiveness, that Jesus would also forgive his sins in the same way that Jesus forgave our sins. I gave him a prayer to do that, and through the tears, I sent that letter. We didn't know until later, but Max was actually dying from muscular scler sclerosis and was under the care of a hospice nurse at the time he received our letter. I met that nurse through a weird set of events later on, she said he was very, very close to death when he got the letter and she read it to him. She said, I don't know what he had done, but he was obviously pretty bad. It was, must have been bad, and he just cried and cried and cried the whole time that I was reading the letter. He got down at the end and said, would you read that prayer to me again? I need to pray it. If Max... The man who molested many girls in this very brutal way repented and prayed that prayer for the forgiveness of sins, then Max would be in heaven even now. Not because he's good, because there was nothing good in him, but because that's how good Jesus is. In the same way, I will be in heaven one day, not because I'm good, but because there's nothing, because there's nothing good in me, but because of how good Jesus is. That's the reason. As hard as it was that day, our family chose to let that go and forgive and forgive. And that was the day that our lives changed. The day I forgave was the day God set a prisoner free. And that prisoner was me. Today, my sister is married and has four children and helps people all the time to recover from the same thing that she endured. And the only reason she is able to do that today is because she forgave someone else as she has been forgiven. Therefore, it no longer has power over her. End of story. I don't know who it is today who's carrying an offense and won't let it go. It could be something significant like what I just read. It could be that annoying person that you just can't get over in your life. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, he calls us to a higher standard. The world is going to teach you, love those who love you and hate those who hate you, and that's fine. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. We actually do it differently. We pray for those who persecute us, and we love our enemies, and we forgive as we have been forgiven. That's how good our God is to us, that he freely forgives us. And in the same way, we learn to forgive as we have been forgiven. For God, I don't think it's a process. But for us, it is a process. But it's the same thing. Let me just ask you directly as we close. Maybe you're carrying a hurt right now, a wound. Somebody did something to you or someone you love someone you care about. Maybe it's something not even that big, but it just, you can't get over it. Will you choose today, will you choose today to start seeking God and ask him to help you forgive and let it go? To be a great forgiver. If so, bow your heads. Let me pray for you right now. God, 
I thank you for speaking to us today. We ask, God, that you would give us the ability to do what is not humanly possible, but is only supernaturally possible, to forgive what seems unforgivable in the same way, God, that you've forgiven us. Help us to forgive others. We thank you that the same grace that changes us has the ability to change others. Teach us, God, to love like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus. I pray, God, that the healing will start as we choose, as we choose just by just praying for that person, just praying. God, do something in their life. Even if our prayers don't change that person directly, God, thank you that they will change us. Then, God, as we keep praying, as we walk intimately with you, we, we thank you, God, that you will give us the ability to do what seems impossible, to forgive others as you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. One more thing before we close. You know, you can't even begin to love as Jesus loves or forgive as Jesus forgives until you first receive the love that Jesus has for you. 1 John 4.9 makes that so clear. In fact, 4.19 says, We love because he first loved us. That's where love comes from. And it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son so that we might have eternal life through him. For some of you that are here today or listening at home because God has invited, I think God has invited you here because he wants to show his love to you first. He wants this, you to settle that love once and for all and receive his forgiveness right now because of what Jesus did on the cross, becoming sin for you, dying and being raised from that cross being alive today, that when you call on him and, and ask for his forgiveness, he's there to give it. And he will remember our sins, your sins, no more. The scripture says, if you confess your sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. Many of you, maybe not many, but some of you, maybe not some, but maybe many of you, I don't know, it's why you're here today. It's time to let it go. It's time to call on him. It's time to be transformed. You won't become a better version of you. You'll become a new you. All your old life will be gone, and you will become spiritually brand new. Choose to pray. Choose. It's a choice. Choose to pray right now. Something like this. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Thank you for offering it. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died for my sins. You died for me. Today, I give my life to you. I surrender completely to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the new life you'll give me. In Jesus' name, I ask this and pray. Amen. Will you pray that prayer? God will hear it if you do, and God will bless you. Well, our time is concluded. We've gone a little over. I think it was worth it today, great to see Naomi get baptized and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let God speak to us through his word. Let's go be forgivers like Jesus. It's a process, but let's get started.